Stanford University. Um, thank you very much. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I am a, uh, I'm a social scientist, and that makes me a little bit anomalous thus far, but I'm going to keep us focused on uh, Bangladesh nonetheless. One of the things you might not know about social scientists is that we use props. Uh, so I hope you'll forgive me when I, I commute from Bogota, Colombia, and so I'm under the weather pretty regularly, and my prop is this bottle here of Diet Pepsi. Since I'm from Atlanta, I hope you won't let anyone know that I'm drinking Pepsi instead of Coke. Um, so maybe I'll try to hide it behind the screen or something like that. If I have a coughing fit, I may have to plead for some water at some point. Um, anyway, what I, what I want to tell you about very briefly today is a new project that I've been doing on uh, indoor air pollution and household decision making about cooking technology choices in Bangladesh. This is a, an exciting uh, new collaboration with Lynn Hildeman, who's in civil and environmental engineering. Paul Wise in pediatrics, Mushfiq Mubarak, who is at BRAC, I'm sorry, at Yale, and BRAC, which is a, a large uh, NGO in Bangladesh that many of you might be familiar with. Um, we're, we're extremely grateful to the Woods Institute for its uh, support of this project. I'd personally like to also thank Wally Falcon very briefly for his uh, encouragement in very early stages of this work. Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge the Schwernstein A Park Center as well as the newly formed DFID International Growth Center as well. Um, in addition to its very generous support, the Woods Institute also gave me a, a generous list of things that I need to cover with you today. So I'm going to um, just jump right in if you don't mind. Uh, so you probably know this, but in case you don't, uh, the leading killer of children under five in the world is acute respiratory infections. In fact, the number of deaths due to acute respiratory infections exceeds the combined toll of diarrheal diseases, tuberculosis, uh, and malaria. If you believe epidemiological studies, they really finger indoor air pollution as a principal culprit responsible for acute respiratory infections. I'd say just as a side note, since I'm talking to people outside of my discipline here, that uh, part of the reason that I would suggest this is controversial is I think the biological mechanism uh, by which indoor air pollution is implicated is somewhat unclear. That's something I'd love to talk to someone more about. Um, what's much less controversial, however, is what the cause of indoor air pollution is, which is in turn household biomass combustion. This is the burning of uh, crop dung, uh, crop refuse, dung, uh, wood, uh, coal, brush over open fires for many hours a day for heating and cooking. Half the world's population does this, 75% of South Asians do this, uh, and they do this despite the fact that uh, cleaner burning improved cook stoves are increasingly available. So these are efficacious technologies that reduce emissions or human exposure to emissions. And there are quite intensive efforts going on, going on in a number of developing countries to promote their use. Uh, but these uh, efforts to promote their use and to distribute them uh, commonly fail. So this is really the focus of our work in Bangladesh, trying to understand why, when a highly efficacious health technology is available, don't people use it more? Uh, and of course, armchair theories abound. I have a number of them myself. I'm at least going to suggest to you today, since we don't have the full answer, that some of the obvious explanations uh, really seem insufficient. Okay, so I wanted to show you a few slides just to give you some idea of what we're talking about. Uh, this is a photograph of a woman in Bangladesh cooking with a traditional cook stove. Um, unfortunately, I have to say that it's not the case that when I took this photograph that it was a, a ray of sun glaring into the lens of the camera. This is a smoke that's obscuring your view here. Um, I don't know how cloudy it looks on the screen. It looks pretty cloudy on my laptop here. Um, and when we try to be more systematic than taking a bunch of pictures and trying to figure out how much do we have to squint to see what's going on in the pictures to assess how bad our uh, fine particulate emissions associated with cooking with traditional cook stoves, uh, we find things that look something like this. So this is showing you just a, a randomly drawn episode of cooking uh, from our project. This is showing fine particulate emissions from a pollution monitor set right next to a cook stove. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of the specifics. Uh, I think it's actually not visible here. Right above zero, at least in the slides that I sent, there's a horizontal green line. What that horizontal green line shows you is the EPA's uh, non-attainment threshold for 24-hour human exposure to fine particulate matter emissions. So the idea uh, in general is that prolonged exposure above that green line is bad for you. Uh, of course, uh, it's not just 
Um, it's not just a matter of understanding what uh, uh, different types of cooking technologies emit. It's also a matter of understanding how human beings interact with cook stoves as well. This is something that we've developed a methodology to try to get at as well. I'm sorry, that's why it didn't show up. There's the green line. I'll now try to advance past the green line. There we go. So we, we've developed a methodology. I'm not going to get into this a lot today as well, given my uh, ambitious agenda, to try to disentangle uh, emissions from cook stoves from human behavior and human interactions with cook stoves as joint determinants of human exposure to fine particulate matter. We've done this by using a number of uh, pollution monitors for each cooking episode where we take a baseline measurement right before cooking, uh, and then we run three monitors during cooking, one attached to a person's body, the cook's body, one set right next to the cook stove, and then one in the far corner uh, away from the cook stove in the kitchen. So this, this slide suggests to you at least that we're not totally insane in doing this when you compare, for example, the readings from the pollution monitor on the body up here on the top from uh, the pollution monitor readings and the bottom panel down here from the monitor right next to the cook stove. And finally... Um, to give you some sense of the types of improved cook stoves that we're talking about, there are two, as you'll see, that we're working with in our project. Um, one is a round portable stove. It's that center picture there, uh, kind of a little bit over to the right. Uh, these stoves principally reduce emissions by improving fuel efficiency and cooking time. Uh, the other type of stove we're working with is one with a chimney, which is the one you see in these other two photos. These are from some health education materials that are part of the project that I'll tell you about in a minute as well. And of course, the idea with the chimney is it simply removes smoke uh, from a kitchen. So very different types of technologies with similar objectives. So uh, I, I have to confess to you that I'm not a cook stove aficionado. And for those of you here that are, I apologize for that. Um, so why am I interested in this? I'm, an, I'm kind of a weirdo, but I'm essentially an economist. Well, uh, I would suggest to you that this issue of low adoption rates of highly efficacious health technologies is actually a much more general and pervasive problem than the specific case of cook stoves. And of course, you have to study this in some specific context. So it's the case that efficacious technologies exist for uh, a variety of important developing country diseases, point of use drinking water disinfectants, uh, insecticide-treated bed nets, condoms, vegetable protein supplements. So these technologies exist, and the world spends a ton of money trying to distribute them and, and getting people to use them. Uh, but adoption rates are very, very low, which begs the obvious question of uh, what's all the use of distributing and promoting technologies if people aren't using them in the first place. Uh, our view, not surprisingly, is I'm a social scientist, but uh, our tentative view is that the root issues here are really behavioral. That is, some combination of people not liking technologies, uh, often for reasons that may not be related to their health improvement qualities, uh, coupled with weak incentives among those with responsibility for distributing them. Our, our project is, of course, on the former here. I'm extremely interested in the latter as well. I'm working on this in, in India and China, and we're planning to extend some of our work here in Bangladesh to this issue as well. And there are two other, uh, perhaps more immediate, policy issues embedded in our study of low demand for improved cook stoves uh, in Bangladesh. One is, what's in general the right distribution model for health technologies such as improved cook stoves, or some of these others I mentioned a moment ago? So there's actually quite a, quite a, a raging debate on this right now, uh, and there are two camps. One of the camps suggests that the appropriate model is pricing far above zero, something along the lines of financially sustainable pricing. Uh, I'm an economist, and I don't know exactly what that means, but uh, so, so the rhetoric goes. Coupled with profit incentives for distribution. Uh, and the other is pricing somewhere close to zero, uh, coupled with high-powered supply-side incentives. Uh, the idea uh, with this jargon term, high-powered supply-side incentives, meaning you can provide direct awards for whatever ultimate outcome of interest uh, uh, one desires. This could range from distribution to actual use of stoves to something crazy like actual health improvement. Um, the other uh, more immediate policy issue embedded in our study is this question of whether or not we should really be trying to push uh, our technologies on people as opposed to developing ones that people simply like better. Uh, so this notion of uh, pushing highly efficacious technologies that we have that exist uh, is somewhat prominent, for example, in USAID's activities and, and what's termed the social marketing approach 
to distributing technologies like these. And the basic uh, underlying premise here is either that people don't understand very well uh, the technologies that are being provided to them or that they're somehow making the wrong choice uh, for themselves and that we know better and we just need to persuade them paternalistically. The, the latter view suggests that people understand pretty well, uh, even if not perfectly, the choices that they're making and they simply don't like these technologies. And as I suggested to you, this may be for reasons that are perhaps unrelated to uh, health improvement per se. And in fact, they'd be made worse off by this perspective from adopting these technologies and the role of people who care about improving health with simple technologies in poor countries instead trying to figure out what people don't like about these technologies and designing new ones that have similar health improvement properties but get around these other undesirable properties. So here we have some tension between uh, objectives of health maximization and welfare maximization. Uh, we won't write down any objective functions since I'm feeling a little intimidated by the real scientists and the fact that I didn't understand the two presentations that just came before me. Um, I also wanted to just point out that uh, uh, this, is, this latter view is one that seems to be front and center in a, in a multi-part course here at Stanford that I'm a, a large fan of, although I've never participated in, called Entrepreneurial Design for Extreme Affordability. Okay. So it uh, goes without saying that you need to spend a lot of time talking to people to form preliminary hypotheses. And in fact, this is what we've done, uh, both with our collaborators at BRAC and then in a variety of places in rural Bangladesh. I'll bet you can't spot the Stanford-based researchers in any of these photographs here. Um, I think that goes without saying. Uh, I can't tell you, since this is not a research presentation, a lot of the social science behind what we've done, but to give you a quick overview, uh, what we did was we took hypotheses that came from uh, probably a year and a half of talking to people, and then we designed a, a field experiment to test the hypotheses that came from these discussions more formally. And in fact, a lot of this is still ongoing. Uh, so we're working in 60 villages across two very different rural parts of Bangladesh, two very different ecological zones that differ a lot in uh, rainfall, fuel availability, things like this. Uh, and we're working again with two technologies, as I showed you in the photos before. Uh, these are locally produced technologies that, uh, that different organizations in Bangladesh have spent a lot of time trying to, to promote uh, and have generally proven unsuccessful in doing so. Uh, the portable stove, again, the salient feature of the portable stove uh, is that uh, they burn fuel more efficiently uh, and that they require less time to cook. The salient feature of the chimney stove is that they remove a large share of smoke from households, uh, from kitchens rather. Uh, so both of these uh, have similar objectives of reducing human exposure to fine particulate matter uh, associated with cooking, but they have very different other characteristics. So this is very much in line with our interest in trying to learn about what are the other characteristics of cook stoves that people value. Um, we then randomized uh, a variety of interventions across 3,000 households in these two districts. Uh, so we have a control group, of course. Uh, this control group is coupled with a health education program that BRAC designed that looks like a lot of what's been done in Bangladesh already. Uh, then we randomized uh, prices with respect to one of the major policy issues that I mentioned to you before. Uh, so these are prices that range all the way from free all the way up to full price with intermediate prices as well. Uh, I have gender listed here. We thought about randomizing gender, but we decided that's probably not a good idea. Uh, so in instead what we've done is uh, we've randomly chosen different uh, people within households, in particular men and women, and we've made uh, offers of cook stoves to different randomly chosen people within households. The idea, the idea here is that this is an environment where women don't have a lot of control over household budgets, don't have a lot of authority to make decisions over household resources, but in fact they're the ones that spend four to six hours a day next to these cook stoves together with their children while men are out of the house doing other types of things. And so they might make very different choices than men uh, about cook stoves. Uh, and then we've, uh, we've studied uh, the role that opinion leaders play uh, in, in determining a household's uh, decision to adopt a cook stove or not. The idea, the idea here is that even when you work with an organization in Bangladesh, you're still very much an outsider when you go into a rural village. Uh, and oftentimes, 
uh, people in rural villages look to people that they respect and trust in villages to help guide their decisions. So we're randomly revealing to some people within villages and not others the adoption decisions of prominent, respected local community members as well. We have a, some other work ongoing about social networks and other features with respect to uh, experience with stoves, taste of food, things like this. I'll mention that very briefly. Okay, so let me just give you a, a, a survey uh, of some first round findings here in a nutshell. Um, so beginning with binary offers of yes, no, would you like a cook stove, uh, either at full price or at 50% price, uh, what we find is that, and remember this is coupled with health education, is that adoption at full price of portable stoves is 5% of those people offered a portable stove. For chimney stoves, it's 2%. So abysmally low adoption rates. This is coupled with what's considered to be uh, a prominent health education uh, campaign. Uh, when we reduce prices by 50%, uh, in percent terms, adoption rates go up a lot. Uh, but in, in real world meaningful terms, in absolute terms, they're still pretty abysmally low. So adoption rates of portable stoves of 17%, of chimney stoves of 7%. Um, then looking at price in a slightly different way, now turning from these binary offers of we have a stove of one type or another, yes, no, would you like it, and instead offering people their choice of either stove. Uh, I won't go into a lot of the reasons for why we did that. There's an economic rationale for this. Uh, and offering choice of either stove either for free or at uh, low prices, much below 50%, but positive prices. When we offer cook stoves for free, what we find is that 15% of people want portable stoves, 55% of people want chimney stoves, and 30% actually want neither. So this is, we have this technology, it's available for free, uh, we'll deliver it to your door, 30% 30, 30 of people don't want either one. Uh, then when we raise prices uh, just a little bit, not, not a lot, uh, what we find is that adoption rates for both of these types of stoves fall by more than 50%. So um, to throw some, some social science jargon at you, we find demand to be both highly price elastic and nonlinear. Uh, and this, uh, we think, is tentatively consistent more with a distribution model of a very low pricing coupled with high powered supply side incentives to promote distribution as opposed to the high price financially sustainable distribution model coupled, coupled with profit incentives. Um, we also find, of course, that education plus financially sustainable pricing leads to very low adoption, which seems to cut against some of the, some of the conventional wisdom in prominent models that some development agencies are pursuing. Uh, when we offer cook stoves to uh, male versus female decision makers within homes, uh, we find actually remarkably little difference in choices that are being made. This was a big surprise to us. This is true across uh, different prices, so it's not the case that women are making different choices when household resources aren't expended and they are when, when positive prices are being charged. This is also true for binary decisions to adopt or not, as well as for which type of stove does one want. Uh, of course, it's possible that women anticipate that their husbands are going to learn about their choices. So I don't think that we can entirely say based on this that uh, gender is an unimportant determinant of technology adoption, but from a policy standpoint, it's certainly unclear if it were important how that would be harnessed, uh, given this constraint that we faced in our research. Uh, on opinion leaders, um, so after identifying local community members that are held in high esteem uh, in the villages in which we're working, so these are some combination of uh, elders, political leaders, uh, wealthy residents, uh, and we randomly revealed to some villagers, but not others, in conjunction with our cook stove offers, what did opinion leaders choose to do. Simply knowing what an opinion leader did had no effect on one's own choice. Uh, and simply knowing that what, what an opinion leader chose to do when the opinion leader choice was unanimously to adopt and improve cook stove also had no effect on what a, what a participant chose to do. But learning that opinion leaders uh, unanimously rejected a technology that we offered to them uh, collapsed uh, own adoption rate to zero uniformly across the board, regardless of price or any other circumstance. Uh, I told you we have eight randomized arms in this, in, this, uh, in this experiment, and I told you about four. We're crossing a lot of them, of course, as well. 
Um, so our thinking on this thus far is that opinion leaders tend to be wealthier and better educated. So if a technology is good for them, it may or may not mean that it's good for the modal villager. But if it's not good for them, it's probably certainly not good for the modal villager as well. Okay, so we're not done. Uh, we're, we're vigorously still at work. Uh, some of the things that we're vigorously still doing are studying the role of social networks, some things wading into sociology. Perhaps we should include a sociologist on our team uh, um, that are discussed a lot with respect to technology adoption. The way we're doing this is we are randomly drawing uh, new samples of villagers from our, from our program areas, and we're mapping the relationship of each one to first-round project participants. And then what we're doing is uh, we're taking advantage of the fact that we can make comparisons amongst different second round participants with the same social network tie to a first round participant, but using variation in first round social network member adoption that's induced by our random assignment of prices. So this lets us get around the usual problems of people don't form social networks at random to really understand why social, how much social networks matter for uh, technology adoption. We're not just interested in how much do they matter, we're interested in why they matter. So is it the case that you get to go and try out a technology at your friend, your neighbor, your sister-in-law's house? Is it the case that you get to taste the food and you learn that in fact it does or doesn't taste differently than food prepared by the traditional technology? These are all things that we're going after here. We're also continuing very much along uh, the vein of trying to understand how human interactions with technologies, cook stoves, and this choice are an important determinant of uh, ultimate exposure, not just uh, simply what are emissions if you put a monitor right next to a stove. Some people have to spend a lot of time next to a stove uh, feeding it fuel. Uh, with other technologies, you can leave the point of cooking for a prolonged period of time. That can matter a lot, independently of what's coming out of stoves. Uh, and finally, this may not surprise you, uh, it doesn't surprise me except for the magnitudes, which I won't go into. Uh, we found enormous differences between what happened when we showed up at someone's house and we explained to them we're doing a project and we told them we were going to offer them a cook stove under a certain set of circumstances and we recorded their answer and then we returned a short while, short while later with our cook stove to deliver it to them and ask them to pony up. Change, change, in, change in decision was massive. Uh, there may be some obvious explanations related to we're not credible. We spent a couple of years trying to minimize that. Um, but there are a variety of other explanations we're really interested in. One that may be more relevant for this audience might be the difference between contingent valuation and revealed preference measures of what people really want. Uh, I'm being signaled to stop. Maybe I should, do I have time to go over this list very quickly? But, yes. Let me just, let me just mention a, a couple highlights from, from this list since I organized my talk differently around these points, shall we say, than, than some of the others did. Um, I, I, I would 100% concur with uh, what the other two presenters have said about uh, really uh, the genesis of these projects and their success being linked to a fundamental common shared intellectual curiosity. Uh, money, money for projects like these are important. Obviously, they wouldn't happen without money, but they're not sufficient. In our experience, uh, consultant-type relationships really are not effective ways of bringing together people with different uh, disciplinary expertise to work on common problems. Uh, please, please, if you do something like this, hire a full-time project manager other than leaving it to uh, one of the PIs. Uh, I can't emphasize that enough, uh, not just because I commute from uh, Bogota, Colombia. Um, and um, uh, I would emphasize also that uh, the interdisciplinary nature of projects can really help to avoid uh, amateurish mistakes. As you might think from the project title, we intended to measure health impacts of cook stove technology choices directly. Uh, it turns out that what social scientists have traditionally done who work on this topic is woefully inadequate and perhaps more misleading than helpful. In fact, the true clinical measures that one would want uh, in our case, were infeasibly expensive. So foregoing them all together was a, a good mistake that we caught early on. Okay, I, I know what that means. Thank you very much. <laughs> For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.